Now we have a panel discussion on decentralized approach in HCV management, healthcare delivery systems. This session will be moderated by Dr. Margaret Hellard, Deputy Director at the Burnett Institute, Head of Hepatitis Services in the Infectious Diseases Unit at the Alfred Hospital Australia. She will be speaking to Dr. Khin Pyon Ki, President of the Board of Directors of the Myanmar Liver Foundation, Dr. Huma Qureshi, Government of Pakistan, Prime Minister's Program for the Elimination of Hepatitis C from Pakistan, Dr. Mohammad Radzi Abu Hossain, Head of Service of Internal Medicine, Ministry of Health, Malaysia, and Dr. Tanya Pond Wonsam, MD, PhD, Protocol Chair and Director of Research at C Free Study. Welcome, everyone. I will remind everyone to wrap up five minutes before the end of the allocated time. Again, I remind our audience that they can ask questions in the Q&A section, and we will take those at the end of the session. I now hand over to Dr. Margaret. Thanks, Adita, and um, thank you for the opportunity for us to have this really uh, important conversation um, this afternoon, this evening. Um, before I start, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am um, attending this call tonight. Uh, I'm on the land of the Gadamala people um, in, a, in Victoria, back of the Otway Ranges, and I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land uh, and pay my respects to, to their elders past and present. Um, tonight or this afternoon, we're talking, the, the panel discussion is on hepatitis C, the importance of a decentralised approaches in hepatitis C management, uh, healthcare systems delivery. Uh, we've got four really fabulous panel members who are going to give, their give a presentation um, to start with before we start the panel discussion. Um, so we have as our first present, so we've got as well as with the four panel members are Dr. Kim Pyon Kee from Myanmar, Dr. Huma Qureshi from um, Pakistan, Dr. Tanya Sporn Wonson from um, uh, Thailand, and Dr. Mohammad Radzi Abu Hassan from Malaysia. So we've got a really fabulous mix of, of presenters, but I'm going to hand over um, to Dr. Um, Pyon Kee, uh, Kim Pyon Kee, to, to present first. Uh, I've actually had the good fortune of working with, with Dr. Pyong for a number of years now. She's currently the president of the board of directors of the Myanmar Liver Foundation, a not-for-profit organisation. Previous to that, she was a director general of the Department of Medical Research in the Ministry of Health and is also chairman of the NINI Diagnostics and, and many other organisations. She's a member of the World Health Organisation Strategic and Technical Advisory Group on Viral Hepatitis in the Southeast Asian region has made an enormous contribution both within Myanmar and the region to the viral hepatitis world. So Dr. Pion, I'm hoping you are online. I cannot see you from where my view is, but is somebody else able to confirm whether Dr. Pion is online? Dr. Pion, are you there? Oh, yes, I can see you. Um, will, will the slides be being shown by, by the, the moderator or am I to show the slides? Okay, I'll share the slides. So, Dr. Pion, I'll put the slides up now into slide view, and uh, and share them with you. Dr. Pion, can you see those slides? Good evening. Okay, so Dr. Pion, I will, um, if you just let me know when you want me to move the slides, I will um, move the slides. Okay, so welcome. And um, if you'd like to start your presentation, that would be great. Dr. Pion, you're on um, mute at the moment. Ladies uh, and gentlemen. I'm highly honored to give this presentation on a demonstration project on decentralization of hepatitis C testing and treatment in Myanmar. Uh, on this auspicious occasion of MSF Asia Scientific Days 2021. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. 
I'm trying to, Dr. Pion. It just is not allowing me to do so. Just let me um, technical technical glitch. Hmm. I'm just going to have to stop the share and try again. Just this happened to another time. Um, sorry about this. Let me just try screen share again and see whether that works. Okay, I'll just try and advance the slides. They just seem to be a bit stuck. Can you see that, Dr. Pion? Yes. Okay, I may have to have it on a slightly different view. I'll just, yeah, it didn't seem to want to advance it. So can you see that? Yep. Does that yes. work for you, Dr. Pion? Thanks, let's try that. Yeah. Okay, next next slide, please. No, it is. Ref Sorry, Dr. Pion, I'm just going to have to stop the share again. Right. It doesn't seem to want to advance the slides when I do it um, on my computer. Sorry. Is there somebody else I could try and send these slides to, to um, see, people see those? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. So this slide shows the burden of hepatitis C in Myanmar. Shows that out of the 55 million population, 2.7% are positive for NDHCV. And out of the 93,215 PWID population, 56% are positive for NDHCV. Thus, over 1 million people in Myanmar are actively infected with hepatitis C virus and need to be treated to prevent liver complications such as hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis of the liver. The National Hepatitis Control Program under the MOHS launched the Hepatitis C Treatment Program in 2017, treating 2,000 patients a year with oral GAAs free of charge. Later, treatment is also given to Hepatitis C patients by cost-sharing scheme and public-private partnership at approximately 1,000 to 2,000 patients a year. Also, the INGOs, NGOs, and private clinics in Emma also give hepatitis C treatment services in the sector. Some free of charge through project donations, and some by out-of-pocket payment for the for those patients who can afford. This project was uh, next, please. So this project was supported by Unite as part of the. Headstart project by FI and implemented by Winnet Institute from Australia and Myanmar and Myanmar Liver Foundation. The two study sites of clinics in Yangon are Myanmar Liver Foundation Tansi Charity Clinic, serving the general population, and Bernard Institute Tengan Junkie Population Service Center, serving the people who inject drugs. Next, please. Uh, this slide shows the service integration and decentralization of hepatitis testing and treatment. So it shows that uh, we are we have to uh, select the population to be treated. So uh, first, the people who are attending the two clinics are screened by the rapid immunoassay for hepatitis C antibody, and those who are positive for the Hepatitis C antibody are confirmed by the quantitative test, hepatitis C RNA test using the CFIT molecular test, the gene expert test, which are situated in the two, uh, two clinics. So those who are positive for the HCV RNA are given the pre-treatment assessment. And uh, these are given by the clinical examination, uh, cirrhosis, by cirrhosis assessment by the EPI score, and also for the neural function test, uh, renal function test, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and these tests are 
carried out by the outsourcing at a uh, ISO accredited laboratory. And after the pre assessment, those with decompensated cirrhosis, better cellular carcinoma, renal dysfunction, and prior GA failure, they are referred to the specialist. And those who are eligible, that is, after the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, they are given the TAA treatment. Next, please. This slide shows the cascade of care. So a total of 633 patients were recruited from the two clinic sites, the general population, and also from the periods. So NTHCV was positive in 96% of the 633 patients recruited. And these positive cases were confirmed by the gene expert RNA test. And those who are positive for the RNA test, that is 88% of those who are tested, 5% uh, out of them, 5% were referred to the specialist because they have complications. The remaining 91% were uh, put on DA treatment by regular tester and sofas fever. And Patients who completed the treatment were 99.2%, very high. And patients who returned for the SDR 12 after the treatment were 95%. And patients who achieved SDR 12 at the end of the project was 92%. There was not much difference between the patients from the two clinics. Next. So this shows our uh, the results of the semi-structured qualitative interviews with patients and healthcare providers in the results. So the community-based clinic from this project showed that uh, it was quite a success with accessibility to the clinic and acceptability of the services due to the manageable patient load and uh, because patients also made less visits to the clinics, good clinic setting, good relationship between the patients and the clinic staff, and also low cost because the drugs as well as the investigations were free of charge for the patients. Next. Next. So in conclusion, it's true that the model of care for decentralization of hepatitis C treatment in Myanmar was feasible, safe, and effective so one of the reasons may be that of the net flexible national treatment guidelines, which allow safe gene expert platform for diagnostic purposes, and the use of the pan genotypic TA regimens without genotyping. And another is that the general practitioners in Myanmar are encouraged by the Ministry of Health to initiate patients onto TA treatment in the community with referral to specialists only if there are signs of complications. And also the summary of findings show that there's a very high retention rate in care, both for the general population and the periods, and also good cure rates around 92% at both sites. And also 5% of the patients, only 5% were referred to the specialist, and the rest were treated by the general practitioners. And most of the patients require only two appointments to start on the treatment that is an average of two days. So it showed that this one-stop shop uh, model of care was very successful for this project in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pion. It was great to have you, um, you uh, join. For people um, who are online, we will be doing the, the brief presentations and then we'll have the, the panel discussion uh, after that, just to, to let people know. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Huma Qureshi. Uh, I've known Huma for some time as, as, as well, and it's, it's, she's basically has led um, much of the hepatitis, viral hepatitis uh, research work, but also driven um, the response in Pakistan over, over a number of years now. Huma graduated from Dow Medical College in Karachi and then also um, did an MBD there. But probably just more importantly, um, and, and there's a long list of things I could say about Huma, but Huma is on WHO panels to do with hepatitis C treatment and guidelines. She has um, done stuff around uh, influenza as well. 
but importantly, she's really driving the hepatitis um, elimination response in, in uh, Pakistan. So, Huma, over to you to hear from you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> hi everybody. Hi, Margaret. Uh, so, uh, you, uh, are you going to run this or, uh, or, or should I run it? Uh, okay, okay, Margaret. So, so you're on. Uh, okay, I'm so not running you're... it. Uh, MSF are running it somewhere, Huma. So, okay. um, so, yeah, so, okay, so, I, I, okay, I'm... so, so, okay, so, so that's fine. Uh, so, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so, this is good evening from Pakistan because it's uh, evening here. Uh, so I'll be just uh, uh, showing you the treatment uh, and the hepatitis response in Pakistan. Next slide. So the, we have the current prevalence of hepatitis C in Pakistan is 7.5%, which is uh, of recent of 2019. Uh, and uh, our viremic rate is 4% or almost about 7.3 million cases uh, have viremia or have the virus uh, in them. And these are the people 7.3 million who would need further treatment. So we are the second highest hepatitis C burden country in the world. Next slide. Uh, but we are fortunate that we are, Pakistan is producing a very affordable pan-genotypic generic DAAs and uh, they are available as uh, sofosbuvir and teclatasvir, uh, which is available at a cost of $25 for 12 weeks treatment. And then we have the velpatasvir, which is uh, available for uh, about $120 uh, for uh, 12 weeks treatment. Uh, and our guidelines say that for the first line of treatment is generally SOF and DAC, and those who do not respond, we take them on to the Velpa test fair because of its high cost. Next slide. So taking uh, this notice of the very high prevalence of hepatitis C in Pakistan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan has decided to launch a 10 years program uh, from 2020 to 2030 for the elimination of hepatitis C from the country. And in the first five years, 50% of the population aged 17 and above, which is almost about 88 million people, will, would be tested for the anti-HCV. And then those who are positive will be put to the PCRs and then put to treatment. In the second phase, the remaining people and then children over 12 years of age would also be added on. So till 2020, as of last year, uh, out of the 7.3 million cases who are viremic, we have so far treated only 25% who have been, di we have diagnosed only 25% and we have treated only 6% of the uh, disease population or, or those who are infected with the virus. So this is a very, very low number. Uh, so beginning of 2022, uh, we have to treat almost uh, 0.5 million cases every year. And this is the divide that you see in the, in the, in the slide, that we have divided these uh, 0.5 million over these uh, 10 years. And uh, this is how we are going to really eliminate the disease from uh, our uh, country. Next slide. Uh, so then, uh, when this pro, uh, prime minister's program and, and the numbers were put to Homi Razavi of the Center for Data Analysis uh, to see that whether uh, using these numbers would Pakistan be able to eliminate the disease by 2030. Uh, so he came to the conclusions that the prime minister's program would be able to support the testing and treatment of the 7.3 million cases who have the infection. But the program would not be able to achieve the elimination because the new infections are not reducing to the number that are desired to achieve the elimination. And he said that we have to uh, increase this uh, numbers to 20% each year. So the, using this uh, modeling, we have uh, put these targets into the new our, uh, program. So uh, hopefully with these new infections going down, we should be able to achieve that. Sorry, we should be able to achieve the elimination. Uh, next slide. So we have few challenges also. And the first and the most uh, uh, serious challenge is obviously to bring out the community for screening, testing, and treatment. It is almost about 170 million population who has to come out and get tested. And then the second uh, most difficult thing is the nucleic acid testing or the PCR testing, which is very expensive, is cumbersome, and it's uh, localized to the tertiary care. And that is why we think that in a country like Pakistan, uh, where there is an access and an affordability, affordability issue, 
uh, there's a need to have a point of care virus confirmatory test so that we can go to the grassroots level in the community and get these people tested there and then. Next slide. So then, uh, you know, we all uh, are facing with the COVID uh, all over the globe. Uh, it's a pandemic. So we also suffered uh, with this COVID that in 2019, the prime minister uh, decided to go for the free testing and treatment of the SCV of the whole population. But then the program could not be launched because of the COVID and uh, it is still not launched. Uh, we hope that it will be launched in the next uh, four to six weeks. Uh, the testing and treatment for HCV uh, went down because of the COVID, but it did not stop. Uh, the COVID response has had led to great coordination amongst the provinces and even within the federal capital. And we see there's a huge increase in the capacity to undertake the PCRs. So we think that, uh, and then the COVID data has been shared electronically with all the provinces and the uh, national levels. So we think that all this, uh, you know, capacity building, PCRs, coordinations, electronic data sharing, this all can uh, strengthen or will, will boost the HCV elimination uh, program for Pakistan. Next slide. So, so this is my last slide where, and we say that in Pakistan, almost 32,000 people are dying every year because of the chronic hep B and C. Uh, the timely testing and treatment of these uh, can prevent liver cancer and severe liver disease. Uh, so prevention and care services for hepatitis are uh, very important and have to continue even during the COVID pandemic. And we have the tools and the technology to control hepatitis B and cure hepatitis C. And we don't have to wait to prevent liver cancer and save lives. It's time to scale up the access to preventing liver disease and uh, scale up treatments to achieve elimination of the viral hepatitis by 2020. And we should use the platforms which have been developed for the pandemics and epidemics, and uh, these should be used to address the diseases, including hepatitis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Huma. Um, really fascinating, and I look forward to the panel discussion about the um, positives and negatives of, of, of COVID um, in terms of hepatitis elimination. It's my pleasure now to introduce um, Dr. Mohammad Razi Abu Hassan. Um, Dr. Hassan is a practicing consultant physician and gastroenterologist who has recently been appointed as the head of the head of the service for internal medicine, the Ministry of Health. Currently heading the clinical research center in the hospital Sultan Bahia, um, and also holds the position as chairman of Digestive Health Malaysia Society, a not-for-profit organization. Uh, done a lot of research and playing an important role again in the hepatitis response uh, in Malaysia. Um, over to you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hallett. What, what I'll do is that I, I will try to share with you what Malaysia has done uh, towards hep C B elimination by 2030. So can I can I have the first slide, please? Uh, well, um, the, the first date which I would like to share with you, this is very important. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, maybe what, what I was, yeah, show the, the, the whole lot of the, uh, you, you can show the, the whole um, date. Uh, yeah, okay, that's right. Uh, September 2017 is the most important date uh, for Malaysia as far as treatment for hepatitis C because that was the year whereby we, we get uh, what we call compulsory licensing. In other words, that we managed to have um, generic medications to Malaysia. So by mid 2018, uh, we started the treatment for hepatitis C. We first started at the hospital base simply because of the historically, I mean, all the patients pre DAA. Uh, patients with hepatitis C uh, been cohorted at the hospital. So uh, we, we treat all those patients uh, at the hospital in 2018. Then we realized that a majority of those patients that we have hepatitis C in Malaysia, uh, I would say about more than 70 or 80%, there are RVDU or people who inject drug or people who use drug. And majority of them will be in the community. Um, so it's, it's gonna be very difficult to get them to the hospital. 
in 2019 itself or so, we have been working with Find uh, doing the Head Start project. And it's clearly shown that by decentralizing, i.e. bringing the test and treatment to the community will be the way to go ahead uh, for the eliminations of the hepatitis C uh, in our country. And true enough, uh, it, it was a successful project. And based on that, uh, it becoming like a template uh, as our strategy for the hepatitis C uh, uh, test and treatment in Malaysia. Uh, uh, by 2020, uh, we actually tried to extend our um, decentralization. Um, the, Maybe, maybe I could just give you a, a, a brief idea about the, the way how the public health system or the primary health care system in Malaysia. Throughout the country, we have hundreds of what we call the primary health care PHC center, which will be able to run the test, the rapid test kit, as well as uh, start initiate the treatment after confirming the viremia at the primary health care clinic itself. So we are used at the same time also, this is also a place whereby all the methadone uh, patients uh, uh, um, attending uh, the clinic. So we have what we call this um, uh, easy access patients for hepatitis C. So uh, we provide all the facilities uh, to test and treat patients with the hepatitis C at the primary health care. And at the same time, we realized that quite a number of patients are actually in the prisons and also drug rehabilitation center. So by that virtue also in 2020, we have started the some pilot project at the prison. And also we have successfully treated many of the hepatitis C patients uh, at the drug rehabilitation center. But I must say that treating the patients in the prisons is quite challenging. Uh, we have started with the two pilot projects, but somehow or other, it wasn't that successful because of the COVID-19 um, in 2019 and also still a major issue in Malaysia until now. So treating the patients, especially those in the system itself, i.e. those patients who have been attending the methadone health clinic and those, patients, uh, those uh, clients in the drug rehabilitation center has been very, very successful so far. But as you can see, these are the patients who are linked to our healthcare system. So now I think we have to uh, start to find a strategy on how to get a lot more uh, people who use drugs, especially in the community who have not come to the healthcare center. So that, that, that brings me to the next slide, please. So what we are trying to do from 2021 onward is that to find so-called the missing million because so far, these are the low hanging fruits. There are patients at the hospital who are already available there. The uh, patients, uh, uh, people who inject drugs, uh, who are already attending our methadone clinic, so they are easily accessible. So we are settled with this group of patients. What we are planning to do now, and from 2021 onward, will be how to find the missing million, i.e. people who are injecting drugs but are still out there in the community at large, uh, for some reason, they, they're not coming uh, to seek uh, for treatment uh, at our healthcare facilities. And also uh, quite significant proportions of them still living in the prisons. We have to figure out on how to settle our logistic problem in treating the patients uh, in the prisons. And also I must say as well, quite a number of uh, subgroup populations or vulnerable group MSM, for example, and as a sex worker, who for some reason, they are also probably not forthcoming to our healthcare facility to, to get tested and treated. So this is our challenge that we are trying to do right now. So uh, we have been figuring out or trying to strategize the new maneuver, trying to reach out this group of population, which I think I'm, I'm actually looking forward to listen uh, to the other panelists as well on the best way on how to do that. Um, I, what we are trying to do also that we, we are also engaging with the um, um, FINE as well as the NDI 
some few projects which we may think that it may help us on how to get uh, to find the missing million. For example, like we are doing the shortened durations of treating hepatitis C uh, using soft and rabid dust way from 12 weeks to eight weeks. We are also trying to do the self uh, testing for hepatitis C among general population as well as the um, uh, MSM uh, and also another study which worth mentioning uh, we are doing the um, one-stop center to treat hepatitis C. So with that, I, I, I end my presentation. I'm looking forward to listen to the discussions as to way forward on how to look for the missing million. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, it's incredibly interesting. Um, and I mean, I. I look forward to asking you about also Malaysia's efforts to make treatment affordable to all, which I think was a really, it's a really interesting story. It's um, my pleasure to introduce our final speaker um, for, the, for the panel, Dr. Tanyana, so Tanya Porn Wonsum. Um, Dr. Wonsum is the protocol chair of the Sea Free Study and director of the research at Dream Developments Foundation. She also serves as an investigator on the hepatitis Transplanted Science Group of the US NIH AIDS Clinical Trials Group under the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. She consults with USAID funded HIV and STI programs through uh, FHI 360 in PATH in Thailand and Vietnam, and also serves as the country's clinical liaison for the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Watson, on the HIPS, uh, the C-Free project um, that was conducted. So over to you, please. Thank you so much. And thanks for the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak on this esteemed panel. I feel like many of the other uh, panelists are much more senior and experienced than myself, but I'm very excited to uh, be here and share about the C-Free study, which was the first uh, integrated community-based testing and treatment for hepatitis C in Thailand among people who use drugs and their partners. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So as many people have discussed, hepatitis C among key populations is really a huge issue. Uh, the key populations that I want to just talk about briefly today are people who inject drugs and men who have sex with men. So overall in Thailand, we have around 1% uh, HCV prevalence if you look at the entire country, but <clears throat> obviously people who inject drugs uh, are a key population and WHO estimates about 58% have uh, hepatitis C positive antibody. And overall, P would also account for 50 to 60% of all HIV, Hep C co-infections worldwide just due to shared webs of transmission through you know, bloodborne infection. And then uh, Dr. Hassan talked about this briefly, but men who have sex with men recently have been identified as well as an emerging key population for hepatitis C infection. There have been multiple outbreaks and increasing incidents noted globally, especially also in Thailand. So you can see a study that we did here among HIV positive MSM in Bangkok uh, through the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Uh, starting in 2014, this is a prospective cohort. They receive HIV care here and all these people are identified during acute HIV infection, but you can see that incident HCV infection uh, increased drastically from 2014. And then this has continued through 2021. Um, just the numbers of new hepatitis C infection among this community. Uh, when we looked at risk factors, methamphetamine use, so any type of methamphetamine use, and not just injecting group sex and syphilis co-infection are key risk factors in this population. And there has been a rise of chem sex or using drugs uh, around sexual activity that really has pushed uh, hepatitis C to be a big problem among the men who have sex with men community. Next slide, please. So uh, you can just click through so you can see everything. Yeah. So this is uh, because of all these issues, we have uh, conducted the C-Free study. It started in May 2019, and it's the first study to offer community-based integrated hep C treatment to active and former drug users and their partners. Uh, in Thailand, hepatitis C care is still not very decentralized. So it's really exciting to hear about other places in the region. It's still hospital-based. You still have to go see a specialist for a prescription of DAA in Thailand. So this is a very big barrier for people 
who maybe don't live near a hospital center with a gastroenterologist or ID specialist, for example. And we wanted to decentralize and show that this is a possible and effective in the community. And so what we did is we partner with uh, community-based organizations who are providing outreach and harm reduction services to people who inject drugs or people who use drugs in the communities themselves. And we have uh, just a room in their harm reduction center where we have all our equipment. We have a research nurse uh, and a research assistant in every um, harm reduction center. And basically these are drop-in centers. We provide uh, everything through that one room essentially. So for our study, we have very broad inclusion criteria. Those who are 18 and over provide informed consent and either have a past or current history of drug use, any kind of drug use, or, or are sexual or life partners. Oh, can you go back? Sorry. Um, yes. So in the CFRI study, first, we just offer testing and diagnosis to whoever wants to come that meet these inclusion criteria. We offer HIV, Hep B, and Hep C testing right now. If you're negative for Hep B, we actually offer immunization as well at the center. So that's a big draw. And then for hepatitis C, if you test positive and are found to have HCV RNA, we use uh, Cephid and Gene Expert as well, just like Dr. Pion's study in Myanmar. So that's great. Uh, so we can offer this point of care testing. Uh, we offer 12 weeks currently of soft bell or sofosbuvir vilpatisvir uh, if you meet eligibility criteria. And you can go to the next slide. So our eligibility criteria are very similar to the ones used in Myanmar for community-based care of hepatitis C. You just have to be HCV RNA positive to be included by um, gene expert. And then our key exclusion criteria are if you had prior treatment failure or really severe liver disease where you would benefit from referral to a specialist or tertiary care center. Uh, and also um, renal failure, for example. We also use APRI score, or this is just AST to platelet ratio. So very easy to obtain from any lab. Um, if it's two and above, we refer for abdominal ultrasound to rule out hepatocellular carcinoma and also send other specialty labs. So um, yes, and then you can click, click through. Um, a problem in Thailand uh, right now is ephedrines for HIV is still first line treatment and soft bell cannot be taken with ephedrines. Uh, also, it cannot be taken with rifampin or rifampicin. So uh, if patients are either taking these drugs for HIV or TB treatment, we're asked to switch or wait until therapy is done. Oh, yeah. You can go ahead. Uh, next slide, please. So just quickly, these are the cohort results. We have been impacted by COVID as well, but over the past two plus years, we've enrolled uh, over 1,300 participants. And you can see uh, one great thing about this study is we're trying to locate all over the country. So many hepatitis C studies in the past have just been based in big cities like Bangkok or Chiang Mai, for example. So we do have sites there, but we also have two sites in the south, the Songkla and Naratiwat, which is on the border with Malaysia. And so um, that has been great to see. And these we work currently at these six uh, different drop-in centers. And then one great thing about our study is close to 75% of the participants are referred by community outreach workers. So who go into the communities, talk to people who inject or use drugs uh, and bring them in for testing and treatment. These are some key cohort demographics. Uh, go ahead, you can go to the next slide. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but you can see the majority of our participants are still male. So uh, about 85% of them are male. We have an older cohort, uh, you just have to be 18 to enter, but the median age has been 42 years of age. And then we have an increasing amount of men who have sex with men, so 13% currently. And uh, they have just started community-based testing of hepatitis C antibody among men who have sex with men and transgender women, among other community-based organizations in Bangkok and other cities who serve these communities. And then they refer them to C free if they have a positive hep C antibody. Um, and then, yes. Uh, oh, can you go back to the previous slide? I just wanted to highlight that 85% uh, of our cohort, even though injecting drug use is not uh, inclusion criteria, report a lifetime history of injecting drug use. So we have very high proportion of um, people who currently or previously injected drugs, about 35% uh, currently inject drugs upon entry. And then um, for HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, you can see close to 40% of our cohort are currently infected with HIV. Many of them were known before they came to the cohort, so 94% uh, 
on ART and high retroviral treatment currently, and about three quarters have undetectable hep C RNA. We have a 5% um, prevalence rate of hepatitis B uh, upon entry into the study, and of only a quarter are hepatitis B immune. The rest are all offered hepatitis C immunization. This is not covered in the Thailand National Healthcare Plan, so a lot of people are happy that they have the opportunity to be immunized. And then you can see overall from our cohort, close to 70% are hep C antibody positive. Of those, 83% uh, had positive hep C RNA, and about 10% of our cohort is cirrhotic. And then uh, finally, you can see we have an excellent uh, HCV cure rate uh, known as SVR. So the per protocol, if you attend your visits, um, come back to the clinic, uh, it's close to 96% exact, actually. And uh, this is our hepatitis C treatment cascade. I just wanted to um, point out that there is some drop off between the different bins or steps of treatment. And that's because our study is still ongoing. So the majority of participants uh, are in the process of completing visits or awaiting SVR since you need to wait 12 weeks from the time you finish treatment to measure or not whether you are cured. If you look at the intent to treat rate, it's 92%. So excellent rates. It's very similar to actually Dr. Pion's study uh, presented in Myanmar. And then finally, everybody enjoys pictures. These are some pictures from the drop-in centers and the community centers uh, that we work in. So I wanna just thank everyone and that's it. All our funders and partners, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Wonson for that. Um, I think it's now time for the panel discussion. So um, I'm wondering, can if we end the slideshow and um, have the panel members, if they could be, um, is there a way of showing the panel members? I'm not sure whether I'm getting any feedback from anybody. Is there a way of showing the panel members? I can see you, Dr. Wonson. Lovely to see you. Um, <laughs> I can't okay. see the actual session, so yeah. then I'm. Yeah. yeah. Could um, could I, could I ask the, the the panel members if they could put on their videos, please, um, and 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 be if if they could be unmuted, if everybody else could stay on on mute for the time being, um, that'd be great. And and we could we'll just start off the, the session. I'm, I'm not sure whether there's a way of, of us all being shown on screen or not, but um. Possibly not, I thought there was. So I'd just like to summarise and say that was four fantastic presentations, um, which are highlighted uh, what I'll call the challenges of community-based treatment for hepatitis C, but also that it can be done highly successfully. And and so I I'm, I'm, was first sort of thinking whether I'd ask people to, um, you all described slightly different challenges in your presentations and, um, Dr. Kreshi, one of the things that I think I'd be really interested in, in your kind of commentary on, where I think Pakistan seems to be ahead of, of a, a few of the, the other countries, is that the government's support for scale up to an elimination program. Really interested in your thoughts as to how Pakistan managed to have that happen. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, Margaret, actually, you know, uh, it was in 2019. Uh, that uh, our minister, uh, the, the government was changed and we got a minister who, who was a medical doctor uh, and who was kind of a, a friend of ours. So, you know, we, we really told him that this is a major issue and somebody has to really take it easy, so, so uh, take it seriously. So, you know, it, it, it's using, using the real right people at the right time uh, approach. So, and, and that minister was very close to the prime minister so the day i presented him this uh, you know uh, the disease uh, pattern and the and, and the second highest prevalence country in the world so the same day he went to the prime minister and he came back the same evening saying that you know i have managed the prime minister to convince that he will support the program uh, so so you know it was just the right time and the commitment for the political commitment but you know, had the, there been no COVID, uh, probably we would have launched the program, but unfortunately uh, we are still struggling with this. So hopefully we'll do it uh, in the next few weeks. Over, thank you. Thanks. Um, Dr. Pion, uh, Dr. Hassan or Dr. Wonson, be really interested in your thoughts in your countries as to how you 
think, you know, you've got these great pilot programs, um, ways forward to launch launch it to get sort of funding from government and whether you've got thoughts or strategies or how difficult that may be in any of your three countries. Dr Pion, I know it's obviously quite complicated in Myanmar at the moment. I don't know whether you want to comment on that, but also interested in the thoughts of Dr Hassan and Wonson about how, how, how you might sort of push your countries forward um, to, to get broader funding. Shall I start first? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we, we are very fortunate because um, the, um, it is very well supported by the government of Malaysia. Um, as I put up in my first slide, which I put up the date where the, the, the year 2019 is the year whereby we obtained compulsory licensing. Because at the end of the day, uh, whatever they're going to do, whatever strategy they're going to do, we have to make it the drug available and accessible. And, and we all know, I, I mean, uh, at the beginning, uh, Malaysia be, being the high middle income country, we, are, we, are, we don't have the privilege of having the January. So we have to get this, uh, uh, this compulsory licensing. So there, there was a strong political will and also support from the government of Malaysia who managed to get the um, compulsory licensing or the government rights to bring in the generic to the affordable price. Um, so um, when, when we managed to do this, I think we have escalated the test and treatment at the, where I think probably a hundred times before the era of the DAA. Uh, I mean, the number of patients that have been treated, so on and so forth. The, the good thing about Malaysia, because uh, everything is free. Um, treatment is free, the diagnostic is free. Uh, um, so it, it's not an issue at all. And be, because of the very good healthcare system, whereby we have what I mentioned very briefly during my presentations about the primary healthcare, which is across the country. I mean, in every locality in these districts, there will be at least one um, primary health care, which will be well equipped in terms of the uh, providing the testing as well as providing the confirmations of the uh, test and treatment uh, is, is available. I mean, it's not an issue. So drug is available. There, there is uh, what we call this the constant uh, allocations of the drug. Uh, millions of money has been allocated just simply for the hepatitis C. Uh, because of that uh, support and also the allocations for the testing. And it's just a matter of how you distribute to, throughout the country and the hospital as well. Um, so that's why I think we extend up to, to the point outside the uh, Ministry of Health facilities, i.e. the rehabilitation center. And then we, we are seriously looking into the treating the prisons. But I can tell you the the problem with the prisons, I think a lot of issue, which I'm, I probably uh, maybe... Margaret, you can help me. Uh, the, the, the Australia experience is fantastic. I mean, how you, you all manage to treat a, a prisoner. But we have a whole lot of problems, especially when the whole, uh, COVID uh, came in 2019. Uh, the program for, for the prisoner has sort of been halted to a certain extent. But yeah. somehow, the, somehow the, good, the good thing, I mean, even the COVID in 2019, the number of patients that have been treated throughout the country has doubled. In fact, because just, just to show how the decentralization has been successfully been done. So all in all, I, I feel that, I mean, we, we, the, the low hanging fruits clients has all been catered and been accessed with at the moment. So what, what Malaysia is now trying to do is trying to how to reach out those who are still missing in the community. Uh, so for some key population, even among the people who inject drugs, there are quite a number of them who are not in the system. They, they just somehow, because of the stigma, because of the decriminalizing, uh, the, the criminal, <laughs> the, the police problems, so on and so forth. I think this is really an issue that they're not coming to us. And also, there are also some, uh, particularly uh, like the MSM, the sex worker, uh, again, some issues of stigma and so on and so forth. They, they're not coming forward despite of that we're trying to reach out for them. So these this are our approach now. I mean, how to reach out this group of population in order to work towards eliminations of the um, uh, 2030 
uh, hepatitis C. We, we are hoping, in fact, we are optimistic that we probably can hit earlier than that if we can manage to reach out this, the, the missing million uh, in the community. And there, there are a few, there are a few R&D or research and development that Malaysia has done, I, I, I should mention, uh, because of the time constraint just now, I did not do that. I think one of the key success why uh, we have achieved this far is simply because of our good collaborations with the, not just intra, uh, in, in, within the country itself, within our uh, external agency within the country, but also with, with the collaborations that we have been working with the NDI with the FIND and also with the other uh, institutions, very close and not, not just in terms of the operational, that, uh, but also with, in terms of the doing the research and uh, development. Uh, Head Start project, for example, by the, together with FIND and the NDI, I think this is actually shape our decentralization um, and uh, it's, it's due to be uh, uh, published. And we have done uh, the, Soft and Duck Lab, because again, uh, no, sorry, Soft and Ravi Daswe, the Ravi Dust trial with the, um, with the DNDI. It is, 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 has been shown that it's highly effective, uh, probably it's much better, uh, a lot better than what we have right now, i.e. Uh, Soft Duck Lab, because of the drug drug interactions and also of the, you, you don't need uh, rabivarin for the cirrhotic patients. So this is also another, another advantage. And um, uh, I, I think this drug is affordable and as I think it's not just for Malaysia. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that it will go beyond Malaysia, perhaps uh, any of the third world or second uh, world country who would like to have uh, this particular drug. By all means, I think this is, this is the way to go. And we are embarking also on how to make it more feasible. Uh, in terms of the drug, shorten the duration from 12 week to eight week, uh, because from the earlier study, the one that we have done to, uh, for the storm study for Ravidasve, we have shown that, that even by using soft and Ravidasve, we have shown that the, the viral load is, is already suppressed as early as two weeks. So why not just shorten the duration and that will improve the compliance, especially among the, um, the, the people who inject drugs. Uh, that certainly will help, I think. And also we are embarking, yeah, also we are embarking on the one-stop center. I think some, some of the uh, panelists just now, I think share about their experience using Safford, uh, uh, i.e. whereby you can actually confirm the viremia uh, on, on the same city. So we are doing the same thing as well in a few uh, primary health care, and it's doing very well. So I, I think, by, by all this technology, by all this uh, research and development that we are dwelling in at the moment, I think that will also reach out the, the people who are still at large in the community who are not coming forward, whereby we will try to reach out for them rather than waiting for them to come to our facility. So this is another, another, another area that we should try to explore as much as possible and also self-testing. Malaysia is also embarking uh, on the self-testing. We have completed the study among the MSM looking at the acceptability, uh, acceptability and also the usability of the self-testing among MSM and also the general populations. Well, I think they, they, they are doing very well. So I think why not, especially during the COVID period uh, like this? Uh, I mean, this is the way to go. I mean, you just- I, I, I uh, totally agree. It, yeah, the, yeah. I, I might ask Dr. Um, Winston to make a comment. You, you, you indicated, we just heard from Dr. Hassan that, you know, Malaysia has really moved into primary care. Um, Pakistan, it's there and, and Myanmar is, 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 is trying to get there. And I'll come back to you, Dr. Pion, in a moment about something to do with Myanmar. But Dr. Winston, you, you sort of seem to indicate that it wasn't generally the case in Thailand at the moment. Um, that that was yeah. what happens. And I'm wondering what you think would help you and what others can, and can others help you to convince the government about the movement? What do you think is the block and how does that change? Yeah, so it's really exciting to hear about all the other countries and frustrating uh, to be in a country that doesn't necessarily, I think, have the political will or, but previously did, you know, we had compulsory licenses for HIV medication early on in the HIV epidemic was on the forefront of trying to get accessible medications. 
So I think one um, key issue uh, regarding decentralization is, is what Dr. Hassan talked about is cost. And so there's a monopoly in Thailand. We have one sole distributor of um, sofosbury Valbehazbury. Yes, it's generic, but it's still very expensive. And that's why I think that the government in the national healthcare system is so reluctant to decentralize because they're like, well, we want to make sure that we're going to treat people who are going to be adherent and compliant. Um, but I think just demonstrating or you know giving the government feedback about all these other places where decentralization is occurring and have you know very effective cure rates um, may be a way. And the other thing is trying to talk to specialists. So of course, like I myself am a specialist, but it's very still controlled who can prescribe sofosbuvir and valbazivir in Thailand. You must be a gastroenterologist or you, an internist with X number of years of training, the hospital director has to sign off. So I think this is also just a huge uh, barrier and put, put in place to restrict basically the number of people who can be treated, even though on the other hand, you know, the Ministry of Health is like, we need to test people, we need to treat people. So I think um, we've been advocating for this and uh, others as well. And hopefully um, C Free uh, has, you know, raised um, these points among uh, the government and the Ministry of Public Health uh, to support decentralization. Because I think we have a similar health system to Malaysia. There's public health offices everywhere. People are enrolled, people have national health care. Uh, I think it could be possible. Thanks, Dr. Wonson. That's, I mean, I think it is. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. Look, uh, and, and things can change. I, I, just so you know, uh, in Australia, I was once accused by my specialist colleagues. I'm also a specialist of, right. I think, of, um, they accused me of medical negligence and, and I was going to cause uh, it, it, irreparable like damage. To our, yeah. yeah, irreparable damage to our system by my desire to take treatment for hepatitis C out of the hospitals and into the community. Yes, yeah, so it, it was. Of course it works, but yeah. it was it was it was hilarious. It was we were going to run a mock, and 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 so I think um, uh, now all of those people that that at the time accused me of, of causing disruption and running a mock uh, are all on board, and so yeah, I, they're I think all champions. To, yeah, to, 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 to reassure yeah. you, you can move there, Dr. Yeah. Pion, are you still online? And if you are, I'd be really interested in your kind of thoughts. Um, it was brought up a few times as to how we, you're having to adapt or people are having to adapt because of the COVID situation. And I know that you and the MLF clinic, which is a community-based clinic, um, have done some really nice, like worked really hard to do some adaption. And I know, Jimmy, you've done some as well. But if Dr. Pion, if you're still there, do you want to sort of comment on adapting to COVID? I don't get to see all of the board, so I can't tell who's still online. Dr. Pion, you're on mute. I, I can't get to see her, so yeah. yeah can, can you... She's on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 So uh, also because we carried out the uh, CD2 project with you, Margaret, I think uh, we have full confidence in this decentralization procedure for the treatment of both hepatitis B and C because we are doing that. Uh, since the COVID pandemic uh, started, in early 2020, uh, the National Hepatitis Control Program, they cannot uh, progress on with their work. So since uh, about one and a half years, for the past one and a half years, uh, National Hepatitis Control Program uh, cannot carry out the programmatic works. So uh, Mimalava Foundation, uh, although uh, we have only a limited a uh, number of our members in maybe about uh, 30 branch offices in Myanmar. Uh, we have been trying to get these patients to get. Dr. Pion, you're on mute again. Sorry. I see you talking. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, I think. Uh, I can say more about what um, Mimalova Foundation has been doing uh, because we are also helping, actually, most of our NGOs and INGOs in Myanmar are helping the National Hepatitis Control Program because the National Hepatitis Control Program 
is actually the leader and we are also helping them. The Manuel Foundation was established uh, nearly nine years ago and we now have uh, offices in, we have 30 branch offices, out of which about 20 have charity clinics. Before the pandemic, our branch offices, we carry out the routine uh, hepatitis B and C testing, hepatitis B vaccination, and also uh, health education talks. Uh, at these uh, 30 areas, uh, respective areas, regularly, maybe about for, for each group, it's about two or three times, at least two or three times a month. So uh, we have we were able to carry out a lot of work. But since the COVID pandemic, things have changed. Because at the start of the pandemic, we planned that uh, so that the patients will not get disconnected with the, uh, our clinics and also with the medical officers. We planned for the future because we felt at that time even we felt that uh, the pandemic will be going on for some charity clinic in the office. So we divided our staff into two groups. And uh, these two groups, they work alternately on all, all alternate days so that the clinic will not lose on any of the uh, days. So the clinic remains open every day and the people come in. But during the lockdowns, it is very difficult for the patients to come to the clinic for the patients as well as the staff. So during the lockdowns, uh, sometimes there are lockdowns for several days or sometimes even for a few weeks. So on those uh, lockdown days, our medical officers, they, they take the drugs to their home and dispense the drugs from their home. And also we share the telephone numbers and the Viper numbers with the patients so that the patients can contact the medical officers for consultation, for follow-up, and even the new patients, they come in. And we register them. And then they also have the laboratory requisition reports. And the, on these laboratory requisitions, we write up for the patients the laboratory tests they have to take. And they are sent to the patients through the fiber, taking photos and sent to the patients. The patients took these photos to the laboratory, and they are tested. They send back the reports by the fibers also. So we also to get uh, connected to be connected with our members as well as with the patients. We also have fiber groups so that we can easily communicate with each other. And uh, the clinic, even during the times when the clinics have to be closed, we open once a week, at least once a week, to dispense the drugs, especially so that the hepatitis B patients and C patients, uh, the treatment will be continuous. And also the hepatologists, we have a team of hepatologists actually, 10 of them who comes to the clinic when before the pandemic, they come to the clinic during the weekends when they are free from the hospital works and they give, they render the services free for our patients. But during the pandemic, they cannot come, but they still give, uh, free treatment by a telephone or by the fiber. So we send them the reports of the patients to them and they respond uh, within one day. So we have a quick response from them. We work very well in, co in coordination with them. And so the patients get continuous treatment. So Thanks, uh, at the moment, yeah, Nimalua Foundation is working like that. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I think it's pretty extraordinary. Um, work that's being done under really complicated circumstances and I think is really highlights um, what can be done with 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 leadership and energy and all of those kind of things it's um yeah so it's, it's essentially it's it's turned into an entirely different sort of system but a successful system so congratulations mm -hmm. Puma, I was really interested in your thoughts um you talked about the impacts of COVID there's been some difficult things but also you raised some potential benefits going forward with Pakistan's pro uh, uh, for Pakistan with with what you'd learned from COVID and, and wondered if you'd you'd like to expand on, on on that and 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 how not just Pakistan but others can 
also sort of similarly um, bounce off COVID in a positive way rather than a negative way? Yeah, <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, actually, uh, you know, like uh, Margaret, uh, uh, when, when there was no COVID uh, and the hepatitis program and all other programs were running, uh, since we have had decentralization of the health uh, in 2011, the provinces now have uh, their own uh, systems and their own data and their own, uh, you know, programs. So by and large, uh, it is it is it becomes very difficult for us sitting at the federal level to get the information from each province. You really have to work hard, and you really have to you know request them. And unfortunately, most of the programs uh, do not have uh, electronic data uh, recording, so so they have paper based data. So you know to get the data from them uh, on a monthly basis or maybe yearly basis for to, to find out how many patients have been tested and treated was was really very difficult. Uh, and and then uh, you know there was there was very little coordination between the provinces because they thought that they were not um, under any obligation to report to the uh, federal capital. So with the COVID, uh, what we had is that we have this national command and coordination committee, uh, which works at the federal level and also has, uh, you know, people sitting in the provinces. So this uh, national command and coordination committee is, is actually very, very strong. Uh, and th that uh, was made for COVID. So for the COVID, they started to collect uh, the they push the provinces to collect the data and share it with the uh, federation every day. So, you know, we started getting the information about the COVID testing, about the COVID, you know, deaths and all uh, recoveries and everything. Uh, so, so, so at least uh, with this COVID, we were able to have an electronic, you know, data sharing uh, was established. And then there was this uh, coordination between the provinces so that we would get data every day. And then, you know, for, for the COVID, we also required uh, PCRs at, in large volumes. So then a lot of PCR machines were, you know, donated and were procured. And uh, now we have uh, very strong strength, even if the PCR. So I think we, we have a win-win situation where we have a very uh, large number of PCRs can now be done. So the PCR capacity has been increased many fold. We have a very good coordination between the provinces and the federation. And there's electronic data sharing, uh, which the provinces have been, you know, made uh, used to, uh, which they were not doing. So now when this hepatitis program is launched, uh, we, 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 have, we, have, we have asked the prime minister to let the NCOC continue even and take up the hepatitis activity also so that the coordination and this thing continues. So apparently, yeah, this was a very good uh, situation uh, for us in that sense that apart from the pandemic, we were able to organize ourselves. And then the good thing for us is just, just a half, a half a minute maybe is that, you know, like we have developed our hepatitis C treatment and testing guidelines. And these guidelines actually ask the general practitioners to treat hepatitis at the grassroots level. And we don't ask the specialists to prescribe the medicines. So that, that's it, thank you. No worries, thanks. Um, I'm just conscious we've only got a, on less than 10 minutes to go and wanting to just check whether there's any questions from... Um... Yes. yes, we do have some questions. Thank you, Dr. Margaret. So um, um, we can start with those since we don't have too, many, too much time. Um, this first question is to Dr. Himpion. May I know what is the effort to upscale the treatment coverage in Myanmar after the successful Burnett Fine study? What are some of the barriers to upscale it? Actually, uh, okay. Uh, after the Burnett project, uh, we had several meetings with the Ministry of Health also, and we all agreed that the decentralization was uh, was uh, will be the key to the success of the hepatitis C treatment in Myanmar. But actually, we completed the project in 2019, and the COVID pandemic started in 2020. So. We have not been, the program has not been able to expand the, the decentralization, but uh, we are implementing it. Currently, uh, our hepatologists have also trained most of the general practitioners in Myanmar, 
in the general, now most of the general practitioners, they are also treating the patients in the community, uh, not only in the big towns, but also in the small towns. So hepatitis C treatment decentralization is going on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question, which is, um, for his HCV elimination in Pakistan, what is the strategy, decentralized vertical programs or integrated HCV care? Dr. Huma? Uh, so actually, yeah, it, it, it's a slightly different uh, uh, thing that, you know, we already have these uh, programs in the provinces. Uh, so these pro programs will continue, but the prime minister's program will, will uh, be an add on to the running programs. So the prime minister's program will uh, will procure the um, uh, you know the the, the 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 medicines and the PCRs and the rapid test and will give it to the provinces. So the provinces will uh, save on their cost. Uh, so it's not a vertical program; it is strengthening of the already existing programs. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Tanya Pon. There is a question to you. Is there an intended follow-up of PWID already treated with harm reduction services like NSP, access to opioid situations? And uh, did you have a peer support system? Yeah, so we don't have a formal peer support system, but many of the community outreach workers who bring in the participants, we work closely with the CBOs that we're embedded in to follow up. So if people are lost or imprisoned or arrested, most of the time the community outreach workers who are have brought that participant in will be able to give us information or, you know, help reach out to them or their community. Uh, we are actually expanding. So uh, because the government has taken note of C-Free, we are set to open uh, new partnerships with community health clinics uh, in Bangkok, uh, two of which offer methadone or opioid substitution treatment. Uh, we are in the process as well uh, of piloting or soon to pilot um, some other more integrated kind of uh, options, including prep and other things. And so there are plans in the works and we would like to see in the future, you know, a completely integrated for especially uh, drug users, harm reduction, OST, everything that you said, NSP, et cetera. One-stop shop is the way to go, I think, and key population-led health services. So for Dr. Hassan's question previously, I think to find the missing millions, you really need to use the power of the community to bring people in who haven't otherwise uh, been tested previously. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Wan. Um, next question is to Dr. Abu Hassan. What may be some of the social barriers that the missing millions may face in Malaysia, can you tell us a bit about any criminalization IDUs or others which others may face? Yeah, um, the, uh, I think probably the the main barrier will be the um, I, I would say the the stigma, uh, especially among the uh, people who inject drug. Uh, and to certain extent as well to the sex workers and the MSM. I think be, being uh, in, in this culture in Malaysia as such, I think this is still a, still a stigma. I think that's probably the main barrier why they are not coming forward despite of all the facilities that we have. Um, the, we, we are trying actually the decriminalization. I think that is also, I would say a barrier as well. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the, the people who inject drug because uh, Malaysia is actually working for the decriminalization. I'm, I was very happy for that, but somehow I think this effort has been uh, like uh, been um, dormant for, for a while already. I think after all, I think they have been changing of, of the governments and also the prime minister in Malaysia. So I think this issue has been put aside. So I think it's this is probably the main barrier why, why they are not coming forward. Yeah. So, so somehow or other, I, I agree with all the panelists, I think we, we still have to reach them. Uh, I mean, one-stop center, trying to use any new uh, strategy, uh, innovations like uh, online website. Uh, this is one of the things which we are also trying, self-testing online and education. Of course, I think this is very important to create awareness how important that they get treated. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Abu Hassan. I don't think we have more time for any questions. However, there are there are questions in the chat box, so maybe some of you could uh, help answer those. And now over to Dr. Margaret Heller to um, um, wrap up the session. Yeah, I was going to say we've got one one minute just to wrap up. I just want to say thank you to all four of you for really number one um, tremendous presentations about work that is is just exemplary. So congratulations. Number two. Um, thank you for your, your comments and your thoughts on, on ways forward. I think it's it's the comment, as you all know, I'm a strong believer hepatitis C is a disease that we can eliminate um, globally by 2030. We have got the tools to do it. And what we need is, is the countries like yours to be all working and sharing information and working in unison to, to, to push this along and to support each other and to support countries that are, are going to struggle to move forward. So... I, I commend your work, I commend your effort, and uh, I uh, hope you remain incredibly enthusiastic about supporting both your national and also the global efforts to eliminate. Can I thank MSF for, for their work, also their support of hepatitis C um, and some great work done through pro MSF programs globally um, and commend uh, MSF for that. And, and may you continue that as well, MSF. And uh, thank you to the audience and for the opportunity to, this, today and this evening. So thanks everybody and, and, and look after yourself and keep safe with COVID.